Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. And I am very excited to be here with Travis Baldry, who we I've been looking forward to talking to for months. So we were are going to have an amazing conversation about all kinds of things, and you are privy to it. <laughs> so really quickly, I just want to say thanks to the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programs. I would also like to thank Travis for letting us pr uh, share this program with other libraries, because anybody who knows me knows that when tr I think that libraries working together make magic. And so we made some cozy magic with this program. And we I will list in the chat all of the libraries that jumped on this program because they were like, Trust! so um, <laughs> um, yes, that was a sound heard across Massachusetts. Um, and you can buy signed books by Travis. You can even have them personalized from Auntie's, Auntie's Bookshop. Is it Auntie or Auntie? How do you say it? Um, well, I uh, this is a matter of great debate as an audiobook narrator because both are valid. So it's really just up to you. Oh, well, I'm going to go with historical me. I'm go with aunties. Bookshop. Yes, it sounds more, mm, you know. Um, so I will put a link in the chat for that because signed books are gold and it's time for gift giving. So perfect timing for that as well. So um, Travis had an amazing, amazing book out. Um, a few, was it last year? No, two years ago, um, Legends and Lattes. And it just hit really big, cozy fantasy, um, and it just got so much buzz. And I think created this incredible movement towards something that was cozy and that was fantasy as opposed to dark and not cozy. So Travis, I'm so happy you're here to talk to us about all of this stuff, including your audiobook narrations. And so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we will get right into a Q&A. Everybody, you, you guys can put your questions in the Q&A, and I will moderate them to Travis, but I have lots of questions. So if you've got nothing, I'm good for an hour. <laughs> All you, Travis. Can... <laughs> um, well, hi, I'm Travis. I am... Uh... I was originally best known for being a game developer. I did that for several decades. Um, I used to run a company called Runa Games where we made games like Torchlight. Um, before that, I was known for making a game called Fate. A lot of people tell me that they played that on their parents' laptops. It makes me feel real old. Um, these days, I'm a professional audiobook narrator. I retired in my 40s to narrate books full time because it turned out I really liked it. Mm -hmm. And um, most recently, I'm best known for Legends and Lattes, which I finished writing about almost exactly two years ago uh, for National Novel Writing Month in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and I edited that and uh, self-published that in February of 22. So from no book to done and published was about three and a half months, I think. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> and... Then it became very unexpectedly successful, uh, largely due to the efforts of other people. And Tor picked it up and uh, took it down the traditional publishing route. And uh, that's how we ended up with Bookshops and Bone Dust. Um, they wanted a second book from me. And while Bookshops and Bone Dust was not the book I intended to write, it is the one that I did write. Um, and uh, I don't know how in-depth you want me to go on this. I can ramble for a very long time. So I try to, <laughs> I try to abbreviate it here. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to jump in and say, uh, I want to, I want to learn a little bit more about you and then we're going to talk about the books if that's okay. So Perfect. what were you like as a kid, given that you have had this amazing <laughs> journey? Um, I grew up on a dairy in the middle of Texas. Um, I, uh, so I was a farm kid. And I, I loved reading as a kid. Uh, I stumbled across the, the Hobbit and Dune. And um, my uh, my grandmother was a science teacher at the local school. And so she had a lot of readers that had been, um, that she had taken when the school phased them out. So there were all these different storybooks from different eras that were available. So I was a big reader as a kid. And there was not a lot to do in the middle of nowhere in Texas either. <laughs> apart from hunt lizards and trying not to get bit by spiders. Um, so yeah, I was a farm kid. Um, and then I think in the fourth grade, my family moved up to Washington state and I was no longer a farm kid. And um, 
I wanted to do all kinds of different things. I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to make robots. I wanted to write books. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to write comic books. Like a lot of kids, I had a lot of different ambitions as I grew up. Um, in high school, I definitely wanted to be a novelist. And um, I began a very terrible one, which did not go anywhere. And over the years, I tried many other times to write novels, um, always failing. I always fell apart in the middle. I could finish a novella. I could, I was really, I really enjoyed writing short stories. I never published any of these. Um, and then Legends and Lattes is the first actual book that I wrote. But instead of becoming a novelist, I decided to become a game developer. So um, after a brief detour in web development, which I think almost everyone did at a certain time in the 90s, I, I became a, a professional game developer and did that successfully for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like now you've actually accomplished almost everything that you wanted to do as a kid. Yeah, no robots yet. And I haven't, I haven't animated any cartoons, but you know, there's time. <laughs> That's right. Well, I mean, um, if just looking at the covers of your books and I'm like, maybe you have animated something, you know, like they're very <laughs> animated. I'd be happy for the animated version to come out. Oh, wouldn't that be fun, people? If we had an animated version of Legends and Lattes, oh my God, that'd be amazing. Um, I'm a huge comic book fan, so I'm all over that. Um, Daisy asks, thanks for all your hard work. My uh, my question is about your acknowledgements pages. I know you went through a handful of other stories before Bookshops and Bone Dust. Would you be able to give us a little more on those other writings you discarded if you can? Viv is my next Ren Fair cosplay. <laughs> Ooh, I want pictures of that. So please send them if you do. Um, so the first book that I was going to do was a cozy mystery. It was basically fantasy murder she wrote. Um, and in fact, almost all of the characters that were in that book found their way into Legends and Latte or into bookshops and bone dust. So it followed a 500-year-old uh, elf who was a professor of thalmic forensics. It was basically like crime magic at uh, Ackers, which is the magical university in Thune that Tandry went to. Um, and uh, she was passed over for the deanship and she retired angrily to the hinterlands and became a really bad romance novelist. And <laughs> until few years pass and the dean that she was passed over for gets murdered and they ask her to come back and investigate and she says sure just so that she can shake the hand of whoever did it when she finds them and she comes back with her affable himbo burke her pet griffith pot roast to work with her ex-teaching assistant fern uh to start her fledgling detective agency all of those things moved over to the book not necessarily in the same configuration but they did move over um the other two books that I started and discarded before I got to Bookshops and Bone Dust also included characters that made it to Bookshops and Bone Dust, including Satchel and Pitts and Maylee. Um, gosh, I think there were some others too. Um, but so no, no story was, um, was left uh, without having something harvested from, <laughs> from it and transplanted into the book that I actually wrote. Mm -hmm. So you, you actually never got rid of any deep thing you just kind of incorporated it yeah into i i stole what worked you know um somebody said something to me one time they said um put all your good ideas that you have right now into the book that you're writing mm -hmm. don't save them because you'll have other good ideas later and i've tried to follow that advice and if i have something good laying around that it could go in there and it would belong just put it in mm -hmm. um and those things all felt like they belonged so i included them and Ultimately, I think you benefit from the work you had spent developing them and making them special for something else that's already done when you move them over. And um, I, I, so I'm, I plan to keep, I plan to keep to that philosophy. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to go back again um, to your game, game development and uh, your sort of your journey because game development uses such a different part of your brain, it seems to me, than your creative. Uh, audiobook narration as and then it goes into a different part of your brain for writing um so what aspects of each of those have you pro enjoyed the most so i was a software engineer uh, when i was a game developer and i did run a studio and i, I would occasionally do art or sound design or or, or whatever I, so i did a lot of creative stuff one of the nice things about game development is that it covers almost all creative disciplines mm -hmm. there's writing there's art there's music there's voice work, 
all of those things get incorporated into game development, which is one of the things that recommends it. You've got a lot of creative options. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But unlike most of those other creative options, everything you make in game development goes obsolete. You can write a book now and 40 years from now, it's still the same book. But mm -hmm. if you make a game now, 40 years from now, people won't recognize that it's something usable or valid for the most part. Um, so uh, I enjoyed that variety in game development. And especially early on in making a game, it's very exciting because you're making something out of nothing. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of enjoyment to be had in that. It's a much longer term creative prospect than writing a book or narrating a book. Mm -hmm. um, and finishing is often very brutal. It's hard work. And um, it's, uh, it's really high stakes, but it can be very rewarding. Um, audiobooks is the easiest of all of those to do. I, at least it was for me. I really enjoy narrating. I don't have a background in theater or, or acting at all, but I did read a lot of books to my kids and my wife, and I've always enjoyed audiobooks. And um, one of the fun things about them is that you're taking somebody else's work and you're just adding a little extra to it. It's like you're putting a little icing on the cake. Um, and that's also very rewarding to do. And you get to experience books in a way that you don't as a reader at home alone. When I read, you you know, I you, you, you don't pay perfect attention to everything when you read, or at least I don't. I get distracted by something or somebody asks me a question or I'm thinking about something else for a few moments. You don't squeeze all the juice out of the fruit. But when you narrate a book, you get everything mm -hmm. because you can't not. You have to experience every sentence and you have to deliver that intent. So it's really kind of a special sort of art form that I really like. Um, and uh, writing is, I don't know, if, writing it feels like equal hardness to game development. It's a different kind of hard, but it's also rewarding in a very different way. Um, when you put something of yourself into a book, of your own experience into a book, and someone else recognizes that and then lets you know, it's one of the most special kinds of connection I think you can have. And I was, I was not prepared for how neat that was. Mm -hmm. um, I it was so affected by it that that actually became a sort of an underpinning of Bookshops and Bone Dust. That's a significant element of the book because it was so unexpected and profound for me in writing Legends and Lattes. Um, but it's also just very hard work. At least writing is for me. It feels mm -hmm. like laying bricks. You just mm -hmm. write another chapter, write another chapter, write another chapter. And for me, the best part is when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I can look back and say, oh, look, I made a book. This is great. Um, <laughs> but that is actually a very rewarding moment. Um, which is a big contrast to games, for instance. When you finish writing a game, you're exhausted and everybody has a complaint. Or you, you, <laughs> you know, you're shipping it and it doesn't work on somebody's computer or they wish you had added something else and can you expand it? And you're just not done. Um, and so shipping is a moment of exhaustion and depletion, whereas finishing writing is kind of triumphant. It's like, oh, I'm done. This is great. I did it. This is very, <laughs> it's a happy moment. Um, there's all kinds of things, but I really over answer questions. So feel free to stop me. Okay. Um, because I was going to say, what what made you turn from audiobook narration to writing? Was there mm -hmm. a moment when you were like, oh, I could do this? Um, so I had wanted to write before becoming an audiobook mm -hmm. narrator. Liking writing is a good prerequisite to being a narrator, I think. Um, but a friend of mine convinced me to try National Novel Writing Month again. She's a, also a fellow narrator and a friend of mine. And um, she was convinced that I should do it. And she agreed to write a book also at the same time if I would. Oh. And she did. So she was my writing buddy and is still my writing buddy and a very good friend. And so we both we both chose what we were going to write. And we kept it really low stakes for ourselves. It's a book about low stakes fantasy, but we also tried to keep it low stakes for ourselves because every time I tried to write a book before, I always was too ambitious with it. It always had to be the biggest, best thing ever because if I was going to write it, this was my one shot. Mm -hmm. But Legends and Lattes is obviously kind of a silly idea. If you just listen to the if you just listen to the pitch, an orc opens a coffee shop. It sounds silly. It sounds like you're going to make a joke. Um, not but then it turned out not to be. Orcs are not, very now it popular, yeah. <laughs> now it now it doesn't. Uh, but we, it didn't feel like something, if I didn't finish, it, I was not going to be crushed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I found out it meant a lot more to me than I thought it did as soon as I started writing it. Um, so I also discovered that uh, being a narrator really affects the way that you write. And um, mm -hmm. 
How so? So there's two parts to it. One is that when you read other people's fiction aloud, you're not just reading what you would write. You're reading authors' attempts to solve any number of problems that you maybe haven't even thought of before. And just like I was saying earlier, you can't really skim. You have to experience everything. So mm -hmm. it makes it very clear what you like and what you don't like. And when you think something is succeeding or failing, you have a much better idea of why that is since you've had to articulate the emotional truth of that. Um, so it's not an objective thing, but very subjectively, you find out what you like, mm -hmm. which is really, really useful when you sit down to write. Because <laughs> I think when a lot of us write, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. We're kind of feeling it out. We're going, we're trusting some kind of instinct. And then we find out later that it's not accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish. And then we have to figure out why. You get to do a lot of that work up front if you read out loud. The other thing that happens is that your internal voice becomes incredibly precise. So I know exactly what I will sound like when I read a line before I have read it. I know what the people sound like. I know what their voices sound like. I know what their accent sounds like. You've mm -hmm. developed this connection that you don't necessarily have beforehand. I certainly didn't. And um, a lot of authors will tell you that one of the best ways to edit your work is to read it aloud afterward because mm -hmm. you find all these things that sound clunky or the dialogue sounds forced or wooden or there's a word repetition. I get to do that before I write, mm -hmm. which is amazingly useful, yeah. unexpectedly <laughs> useful. Yeah, I think that, um, and people here can certainly uh, chime in on the chat on this. I think that audiobook narrators can make or break a book for people. Um, 100%. Okay, good. Because I was going to, I only listen to books I've already read because I love to reread and I love the performance aspect of it because I already know the story. And it sounds like sort of really similar to what you went through in terms of like, I already hear it in my head. I just have to get it on paper. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It, it. So in a lot of ways, I feel like uh, the narration of a book, especially in the prose, is kind of like the background music for the book. It's mm -hmm. like, this is the soundtrack. And I think one of the reasons that some narrators are not necessarily right for a given book is because they're just not cast for that book. They don't, they're not the right person to deliver that music. So maybe this should be, you know, epic music, uh, epic fantasy music, but actually they're, they sound like acid jazz, you know, there's just like you, if you've ever seen like where they take a movie like star Wars and they put a different soundtrack on it and all of a sudden it feels really weird. Yeah, I think it's the same effect with audiobooks if the narrator is not like a, a good pairing mm -hmm. or is not on board with the tone of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, two different narrators can interpret a story completely differently. But mm -hmm. I've, I was listening to, I've listened to your um, narration of some of your books, including the Will White ones. And um, I might be saying that wrong. But what I love is that you can do the voices of characters so well. Like a lot of males will read females as very just high pitched, almost hysterical. falsetto. Yeah. And you don't do that. You're just like right there with what a, a true voice could be for a, all of your characters. I appreciate that. It takes a lot of work to do that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. It's always one of the unique but fun challenges of audiobook narration is that you're not being cast for a character that you would normally be cast for. Mm -hmm. Like I, most 46 year old men are not going to be asked as a voiceover actor to play a 12 year old teen princess. It's just not <laughs> likely to happen, but in audiobooks, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, it, I think it's a really fun challenge to try and make people forget that you are a 46 year old man when that happens. Yeah. I clearly don't sound like a 14 year old teen princess. I clearly don't sound like, like uh, many of the characters that you have to voice, but, there's there's some there's a ground where you can get people to suspend that belief long enough to go with the emotion of it. And it's really rewarding to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Audra is actually saying that she's going to this full cast um, recording. It's almost like a uh, one of those old timey radio shows. Radio it's plays. Super yeah, super fun. Um, so what? OK, I, I'm going to ask one last of my own questions and then I'm going to go to the, um, the audience questions because we have a, a ton of them. Um, what is cozy fantasy? And I'm asking this because I feel like you brought it to light. It might have been happening before, but the the success of Latte really brought it to like the four. So what yeah. is it and why was it for you? Um, so like you said, it definitely existed before. I think every Studio Ghibli movie ever made is basically yeah. <laughs> cozy fantasy. The Hobbit is even kind of cozy fantasy, at least the first third, maybe. Um, there's a lot of eating and dwarves and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty bucolic. Um, 
to me, mm-hmm. I think Cody, Cozy Fantasy is ultimately, I, it's a fantasy book that's focused on people instead of events and that ultimately leaves you feeling better than you started. Mm-hmm. That's the goal, that ultimately you feel better. It's like a chicken soup book. Um, <laughs> I was thinking a lot about things like The Great British Bake Off when I was writing it. Mm-hmm. Because these are shows that have drama and I, I get invested in them and I care about the people, but nobody dies. Nobody gets hurt. There isn't even an ostensible villain, mm-hmm. but still I'm engaged in the drama of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's using the trappings of fantasy to focus a lens on everyday concerns and to remind us that they have value Mm. oh my gosh that's amazing um I find I find your um characters really interesting because you picked orcs and you know uh non-traditional kind of characterizations um where I've only seen them in like monster romances so like there's so much else going on in a monster romance but yours are just living their lives (laughs) yeah and and um you know, I think a lot of us feel like outsiders, even if we aren't. I think a lot of us have the feeling that we've been teleported in from some other reality and everybody else knows what's going on and we're the weirdos. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very common feeling. And so I enjoy taking characters that are not normally in the limelight, that are not normally your A characters. They're usually the B or C characters and just having them be the A characters. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think there's a reassurance to that, that we all matter. That regardless of whether you feel like a side character in the world, you, your your story is worthy of merit. Mm-hmm. And did you feel like I, I'm so totally lying that I'm going to ask your questions in the audience because I'm asking mine still? Um, did you do you feel like in a cozy fantasy setting is more important because a setting like a bookshop or a coffee shop are places that we do feel really comfortable. Or I think it could be important, but I think you can get away with anything. I think you can get away with anything if you're character first. You know, I think you could probably make a cozy fantasy horror book. You could t- you could have, you know, you could have somebody in their creaky old castle and still find a way to make it cozy. I don't know. Um, I'm like, no, no, not, a, no. not horror. <laughs> well, it, you know, uh, I bet you you could. I bet you you could. What about what about the you, vampire you that's alone in the castle, you know, and has been there forever and, it, you know. It's all about ultimately about the characters and whether you relate to them and whether their concerns feel relevant to you. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so I'm going to expect a cozy fantasy horror from you at some point. I, th- I think it's a good challenge. I think okay. it's a good challenge. All right. I'm, I'm going to be keeping an eye out for that. <laughs> I mean, I already had a skeletal hum- homunculus, so, you know, I'm working my way there. <laughs> awesome. I would like to see gargoyles too. I'm just putting in some requests. Um <laughs> All right, let me let me not be a liar and ask the questions from our our attendees because we have a bunch. <laughs> Roy says, going back to sort of the beginning, did you have any narrative design experience when you were working in game development? I'm a game developer myself, and your books have inspired me to write fiction. So thanks. Um, I actually didn't have any narrative experience when I was working on games. I didn't write for games until very late in my career. And it was just because I didn't have anybody. The person I was going to hire to write it didn't do it. They uh, they weren't available. <laughs> so um, the last couple of games I I made, I wrote. And I wrote all the dialogue and, and the story to those. Um, but it was certainly not what I was trained for or what I set out to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, best of luck to you. I, it's, I, I really hope that you, I hope, or really hope that you write something you love. Mm-hmm. So you came by that serendipitously, actually, a little bit. Yeah, it was not. It was not. It was not what I started as, and it was. And it was certainly not the bulk of my time. <laughs> <laughs> um, ben says you mentioned that B and B wasn't the book you intended to write. What was the book you intended to write, and is it some way something you might revisit? Um, so I sort of half answered this because uh, when I was talking about the uh, the fantasy murder she wrote book, that was the book that I initially intended to write. It was the book that I pitched to Tor when they picked up Legends and Lattes and had a ten thousand word outline for. Um, and I'm still interested in the concept. So, uh, but what I had to come to terms with was the fact that I am absolutely I'm not interested in the mechanics of a mystery. Like I'm not one of those people that needs to figure out the mystery. 
-hmm. I don't need to know that all the clues were there for me and have this logical progression. I just don't care. What I care about is the vibes of a mystery and the people of a mystery and the feeling of a mystery. So I really liked Knives Out because yeah. I liked watching Daniel Craig and his terrible, terrible accent in the Clue House. And it, I thought it was great, but I don't remember the mystery at all. So I've had to kind of refocus on what I want out of a mystery. So I wrote a short, which may be the genesis of a novel that does that. And basically it's about a chaos goblin who solves mysteries. And most people are not sure if she did it on purpose. Um, and I had a lot of fun with that. And that may be my inroads. So I, I do hope to get back to it. I haven't let it go. <laughs> I love it. I actually love that whole concept of a fantasy murder she wrote because I love murder she wrote. Um, oh, me too. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't really, as you said, I didn't really care so much about the mysteries because I was like, who, who would want to live in this town? But I also yeah. loved the characters, right? They, they were so interesting and intertwined. Um, I, anyways, that's a whole nother story and a whole nother. I, I, Angela Lansbury is fabulous. I just love Angela Lansbury. I could watch her just do whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, teapot. We'll watch her be a teapot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Jody says, or asks, would you mind telling us if you used beta readers before you published um, Legends and Lattes, or did you just dive right in and send it out? Um, I had a couple of people that read it. My writing buddy read it. Um, I had a couple of other beta readers that had a few notes, um, but I did rigorously edit it. So um, I have a friend who is an author. She goes by Forthright. She writes the Amaranthine Saga and a bunch of other stuff. And I narrate for her, but she has an editorial background. So we did a very rigorous edit of the book um, before it was released, in addition to some baiting. Um, the book itself did not like significantly change structurally. It was more about, you know, making sure that we got rid of any last um, um, continuity issues. Um, I think we took about 2,000 words out and put about 2,000 words back. Um, but I did my best to make sure that when it was done, it was as professional and clean and ready for release as possible. Mm -hmm. I think you were successful. Um, Audra says or asks, how do you decide the voice of a character when you're narrating a book? And did you use that same process for reading your own book? Um, there's a couple of ways when you're reading somebody else's book. When you're reading somebody else's book, often the language will give you hints, like how do they speak? Um, and you take into account anything else you know about their age or their physicality or their overall demeanor, and you try and fold that into their voice. I generally try and try to have a good visual picture of them because it helps me deliver the lines mm -hmm. because there's a lot about people's faces that tell you how they sound. Um, and if you see somebody who has like low hanging jowls and you hear how they sound, you understand how that influences the way they sound. So um, I generally try and have that, that mental picture. And as a narrator, you kind of sort of rack up a like a whole cast of character actors in your mind that you know how to be mm -hmm. and that you can then deploy to play other characters. It'd be like if you had Robert Downey Jr. on call, Robert Downey Jr. can play a bunch of different kinds of characters, but you have that base actor to work from to put into those roles, which is really helpful. Um, for your own book, you don't have to do as much exploration because for me, the voice kind of comes first. I know what they sound like and I know what they look like. So I don't have to do that exploration. I've got a really good idea. And some of it is contrast. I want characters that contrast that I enjoy hearing talk to one another. Like their dialogue is pleasing for me to hear. You don't need two snarky people with a British accent talking to each other because it's the same, same person talking to themselves. You want that contrast. Um, but that feels like it just sort of happens organically when you're writing, when you have those voices in mind. Mm -hmm. So this is where we're going to take a slight intermission because Travis told me that oftentimes when he has talks, he will actually narr narrate a bit of his, one, one of his books. I was wondering if you would want to maybe do a couple minutes of one of your books. Let us know how it sounds. Let's see here. Let me see here. Um, I'll have to send one to myself. Let me see if I can do this. What do we want? Oh my gosh. Don't ask me. I have too many options. Um, let's see. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. All right. Here's what we'll do. 
I'll read a little bit from the short. You're not going to get the whole thing because that would take me a half an hour, but. Just a couple of minutes. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's see. All right, here we go. Zill hunched on the buckboard, squinting through rain that drove sideways and slantways and downways and hellsways. It streaked like quicksilver through a globe of light centered on the lantern swaying beside her. Her shaggy, saturated, and increasingly cranky pony glopped onward through the mess of the road. The little goblin's orange hair dripped into her eyes, and her bottle brush pigtails lay sopping on her shoulders, despite the wooden awning above her. A squashy hat sagged equally sodden on the crown of her head. As they slithered and trundled down the hill, she spied a blur of yellow tucked into a valley, the scattered lantern flecks of a tiny village, the night's destination. Hop, hop, round boy, called Zill, giving the reins an encouraging flick. Toasty, toast yonder. He snorted in an aggrieved way, but picked up the pace, mud splashing up to cake his fat belly and filthy stalactites. When Round Boy drew up short in front of the village inn, his hooves slid a few inches through the slop as the weight of the cart pushed him forward. The pony shook himself out like a wet dog. This didn't make him appreciably drier or cleaner. In the weak light coming from leaded glass windows, Zill could just read the sign swinging from an iron bracket above the door, the slippery trout. She hugged her greatcoat tighter around herself and then patted the pockets. There were a lot of pockets. In fact, it was fair to characterize the coat as being made entirely out of pockets, a tailor's madness of different colors and fabrics. Extinguishing the lantern, she sprang down into the ooze of the street, her bare feet sinking in up to the ankles. Zill squelched her way to Round Boy's side, unharnessed him, and led him into the sloping stable. Each footstep was a laborious, sucking extraction for the both of them. The goblin didn't mind that there was no stable hand to greet them. She was used to tending her own stew pot. Round Boy whinnied in relief as they entered the shelter of the stable. It began to steam at once. A solitary lantern hung on the wall nearest the inn, as far away from the hayloft and fodder as possible. Six other horses dozed in the stable, content in their stalls. Three fit geldings, a blocky war horse, a sturdy mare, and a tiny short-haired pony with blue ribbons braided into her mane. Clucking to Round Boy, Zill urged him up into an empty stall, removed his harness and gear, hung them up to drip, and fetched her pony an armful of fodder. As she passed, she idled a curious glance over the tack of the other animals, all hung on saddle racks to dry. Night, night, round boy, she murmured, heading back out into the night and toward the promised warmth of the inn. That was Makes amazing. I, what I find amazing is that you can just turn it on. I mean, is that true? Like, can you just like, it just comes to you when somebody yeah, says, I mean, hey. you, you do this for thousands and thousands of hours and it's just like a natural switch. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, you just get into the, you get into the background music of the book. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I've, I'm completely like flummoxed and I have to ask a question because I can't, um, I can't think of anything to say right now. Um, so Judy, Judith asks, what led you to fantasy specifically or cozy fantasy specifically? Um, so I've always liked fantasy. I'm a big fantasy reader ever since I was a kid. So it's a genre I really have always loved. When I made games, I made a lot of fantasy games, action role-playing games. So I've been kind of in fantasy for a very long time. Um, when I wrote Legends and Lattes, I, um, I was working in my Discord, which is where I narrate live a lot of the time. And I read a lot of high octane action adventure, fantasy and sci-fi fiction. Um, and uh, the stakes are usually sky high. <laughs> and it was the middle of COVID and that was just not what I wanted to read for myself. So mm -hmm. I was joking around and I said what I really wanted to read was a Hallmark movie set in the Forgotten Realms. I just wanted to, <laughs> I wanted a fantasy book that made me feel good. Yeah. Um, and that's not something I get to read very often or mm -hmm. almost ever. Right. No, I would agree. I, 
I'd never really heard about cozy fantasy until I read latte. It was a I and it was a eye opening to me. Um because you're so amazing with the audiobook narration, um was it something was it like an easy step for you, Dana asks, between going from game development to audiobook? Um so I narrated audiobooks on the side for a couple of years when I was in it when I was still in game development and I did it as a hobby just because I liked it. Mm-hmm. Um and I felt it I I I didn't struggle a lot transitioning to doing it um, because I had read aloud to my family for a really long time and I really liked audiobooks. Um, I'm clearly a better narrator now than I was when I started. I mean, there's all kinds of improvements and development that you make as a narrator, but I really enjoyed doing it kind of from the jump. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you're amazing. Um, just that little slice, I was like, oh, so good. Um, <laughs> somebody asked, they didn't, uh, with uh, b- the Bone Dust books, do you think that there's more to Viv's story to explore? Um, I guess this is me asking about sequels, but I actually was really interested in this because you did something I thought was really interesting. After the very first book, you went into a prequel, which is mm-hmm. pretty unusual. So d- do you feel like there's so much more to tell of Viv's story? Um, my original goal was not to tell the direct story about Viv. It was for her to pop up because I wanted to leave her parked in her retirement. I liked where she ended up and I didn't want to spoil it for her. And writing a sequel, it seemed like I would have to upend the apple cart for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I, I liked where she ended up. I felt mean to take it away from her. (laughs) Um, so the way that I ended up writing about a, writing a prequel at all uh, again, not my original idea, was partly because of my experience writing the other books and partly about some thoughts I had about the fact that um, mistakes are the the foundation of eventual successes. Mm-hmm. That was certainly the case for Viv. So at the time, it felt really relevant to me while I was making mistake after mistake trying to write a book. Um, it's kind of meta in a certain way that the the mistakes of those first three books are the foundation for Bookshops and Bone Dust and the fact that it functions. And it is ultimately a book about Viv's early mistakes and the blind alleys she goes down and the relationships that don't work out that are the foundation for what eventually happens to her in Legends and Lattes. Mm -hmm. It's a basically, it's a prequel about the fact that prequels matter. Yeah, the whole Um, backstory, yeah. um, And I liked that. And um, I had recently watched a prequel that I thought was really good and that reminded me that it didn't matter whether somebody survived. The the point was not, the point of a story is not who lives at the end. You know, Um, every book that has a sequel is just a prequel waiting to happen. Uh, Mm -hmm. It doesn't, if if you write three books in a series, does that mean the first two books are irrelevant now? Now that you finished the third one? Mm -hmm. Now they're just prequels. Yeah. So, um, I had watched Andor, which was uh, which was a Star Wars prequel that was done about characters who all, were all going to die. And you knew they were all going to die from the outset. Mm-hmm. But it didn't matter because what I cared about was how these characters changed and became the people that they ultimately became. And that was what was relevant and enjoyable to me. So I thought, why the heck not? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, Rand says... For all the upcoming and uh, inspired nano nano writers, can you speak a little bit about your publishing process for, um, for you? Because she didn't know that it happened so fast for you, only three months. That's so amazing. But we all love the book, so we understand why Tor picked it up so quickly. Um, so I'll give I'll give a very quick answer and then a slightly longer answer. The quick answer is that I wrote up the entire publication process. And if you want to read detailed notes on everything from not having a book to being done, including commissioning the artwork and laying it out and editing it and getting your ISBNs and publishing it. um, If you go to travisbaldry.com, there's a link at the top that says uh, self-publishing A to Z, where I wrote all of that up at length. So (laughs) that may be very useful to you. I hope it is. So there's two parts to the process. There's the actual self-publishing process, which is what I wrote up largely there. And then there's the process to become a traditionally published book. Um, The first three, three and a half months is all self-pub. And that uh, for me, it's, it's broken down into the actual writing, the editorial process, the commissioning of the art and the layout, and the ultimate publication on Amazon and Ingram Spark and 
I don't want to waste 20 minutes telling you all about that since I've already written it up. Um, and then the second half of that is the switch to traditional. So the way that things happened for me was a little non-standard, although I think it's becoming more standard. Um, I had agents reach out to me when the book was already successful in self-pub. Mm -hmm. So the book did really well in self-pub, very unexpectedly well. And a large part of that, I think, is because the book is exactly what it says it is. Um, if you look at the cover and you read the tagline and you read the blurb and you read the book, the book, it is what it says it is. And you have a, it's very easy to tell people what it is. Um, and because of that, a lot of other people ran with it and made it successful. Uh, so many influencers and book talk and booktube and bookstagram, it got out and pushed. So did local booksellers and librarians. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, because of that, agents came to me. I got approached by three agents about taking it traditional, which I think is happening more and more often these days because they can then kind of get more of a sure bet instead mm -hmm. of just reading a bunch of manuscripts and submitting them and hoping they can say, oh, look, this is already achieving success. Let's move it over. Mm -hmm. So this has happened a lot. Um, things like uh, Rage of Dragons, uh, Senlin Ascends, The Atlas Six. Uh, these are all self-pub to traditional pub uh, transitions. Um and uh, so I picked an agent on Vibes. She's awesome. Her name is Stevie Finnegan. She works for the Zeno Agency. She lives on a narrow boat in London. She's awesome. I really love her. Um, and she took the book out on submission. And I think within 48 hours, Tor UK had come back with a preempt offer, which is, it's a timed offer. I, I am fully aware that my experience is very singular and very blessed. So I don't think this is a very standard experience, but uh, you asked and I'm telling you. Um, and uh, I said, yes because I've always thought Tor was amazing. And my journey through publication has been really pleasant as a result. Again, I feel like it was very stacked in my favor. So I know I have a kind of a singular experience, but I've had a really good experience. Um, but all that said, self-pub has a ton of value. And if I was starting over again, I would still go self-pub first mm -hmm. because it allows you to release your book in three and a half months and find out if anybody liked it. If you were to go the traditional route, it's going to be years before you find out if anybody liked it. Yeah. And oh, uh, in that time, you could have written a bunch of books and released them. Mm -hmm. And not only would you be a better writer, but you would have been able to try a bunch of different things. So I, there's a lot of merit to both paths. I feel fortunate that I got to do both. Yeah. I have to um, com uh, comment on what you said about your book is exactly what it looks like and says in the blurb and all of that, because um, a lot of, uh, I read romance as well. And I think I told you monster romance, whatever, but like a lot of the books have like, they're just flowery and you're like, but it doesn't tell me anything about what, what is that? Like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, it, and sometimes it's quite misleading in fact, um, of what's on, on, on in the interior. Um, yeah. so Tara asks where you got the inspiration for Viv's character and personality. She loves how genuine and kind she is to the core. Um, <laughs> This is going to sound really awkward when I say it now, but Viv is a lot of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Viv is a, as someone who did a job into their 40s and then decided they didn't want to do it anymore and moved to another town and switched careers and found this whole really welcoming community. I wrote a book about somebody who did the same job into their 40s, decided she didn't want to do it anymore, quit, moved to another town, started another career and found this really welcoming community. So... I didn't actually realize I was doing this at the time, but very clearly was the case. Um, I, I, in my old age, want to read about characters who act like adults that are adults. Mm -hmm. Because I've re I read a lot of books where there are people in their 30s and 40s that act like they're 18, because that's a way to really wring a lot of drama out of something. And I just am not that interested in that anymore. I want to read about adults solving problems like adults would, mm -hmm. you know, having a conversation, having a hard conversation and then resolving it or, you know, where the conflict is maybe the world and less about our own personal hangups that we haven't gotten over in our 20s yet. Um, so I mostly just want to write about characters that do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and Viv, to me, feels that way. She's somebody who she makes mistakes. She has shortcomings, but. She can be honest about them and she's uh, she's honest about wanting to improve herself. Mm -hmm. And I find it so much easier to root for that kind of character now. <laughs> you know what's really interesting though is that because you wrote the two books, Lattes and Bone Dust, is that 
she rediscovers herself a couple of times. And it sounds like in your life, you know, you went from game developer to audiobook narrator to writer. So like, it sounds like it happened to you as well. Yeah. And I think it's really freeing to to come to the realization that you get to reinvent yourself, that you get to have a different kind of life multiple times in your life. That's one of the, I think, the attractive things about Legends and Lattes is the idea that just because I spent all this time becoming one kind of person doesn't mean I can't become somebody else, mm -hmm. which is very freeing because you have kind of like this sunk cost fallacy. You know, I put all this time in. Is there even time to do anything else? Can I do anything else? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. You clearly can. It's just a little scary. Right. And it's... um. It sounds like it's also very um, rewarding if you take that. It is very rewarding. Yeah. You know, you feel like it almost feels like cheating. It's like I got to have I got to cram another life in here. It's really nice. <laughs> um, Audra says her nine year old, who is a huge fan, um, wants to know if you would do just a, like a few seconds of your favorite character voice for us. Your favorite one. <laughs> oh, that's hard. That's hard especially without any dialogue. Um, it's easy to do, hmm. but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I, I, uh, I may have to come back to that. I don't, I don't know if I can do that without, uh, without some dialogue in front of me. Gosh, gosh. And none of those character voices are super over the top. Um, um, I have lots of favorite character voices, but they're usually not from my book. <laughs> That's Oof. okay. You don't have to, but I, uh, if you come up with something before we end, that would be great. Okay. Um, Sarah S and I, I have the same question. Do you have any other cozy fantasy book recommendations? Because it's a genre we're just discovering and we want to know more. I really like T. Kingfisher, uh, Ursula Vernon, um, things like Thornhedge. I think that the Paladin's Grace is also kind of, they're a little bit, little bit higher stakes, but they have a similar kind of vibe where it's about, uh, it's more about the people I, um, I think Nettle and Bone also maybe qualifies. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you also can't go wrong with Howl's Moving Castle. <laughs> you think Howl's Moving Castle is low? I think it's cozy. You think so? I think it's cozy. I think oh, so. I think so. Well, um, you did say Studio Ghibli or Ghibli. Yeah. So, wow. I've never really thought of Howl's Moving Castle as uh, cozy. Okay. Um, it just depends on what, I mean, it depends on what your personal definition is. Um, but I felt better after it. <laughs> the book or the movie? God, both, I think. Both, okay. I think. Well, then it must be. Um, so somebody says, one of the things I love about your writing is that you don't feel the need to explain every fantasy detail of your world. You provide exactly enough to get the reader to understand and not get bogged down. How do you know how much to provide and how much to hold back? Is this some coming from your history? It's definitely coming from audiobook narrating. Okay. Um, I have I can draw a pretty clear line between what I wrote before and what I wrote after. Because when you actually have to say all that stuff aloud, when you actually have to articulate the orcish political history and talk about all of the knives and forks and where the carpets came from aloud and try and make that interesting, it makes it really obvious when it isn't. So um, <laughs> I I have found that I just don't, I'm not interested in that stuff anymore. Um, and when I wrote earlier, I put it in because I felt like I had to, like I had to, I just had to convince you. Mm -hmm. But I have found that there's like an uncanny valley of detail where you put in so much detail that it feels like the author is trying so hard to convince you that I immediately distrust it. And it only takes one logical break for me to, for the whole house of cards to fall down. You want to tell me all about your economic system? Well, if you didn't think it through just well enough and I find this hole in it that makes the whole thing fall apart, then all of a sudden I don't trust the entire rest of your story. So maybe you shouldn't have told me about the economy. <laughs> I have to say that's true. Like uh, that, um, that it pulls me out of the story and that's not where I want to be when um, there's um, a lack of continuity in those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. What I have found works for me as a, like a shorthand to how I want to do world building is that I do character out world building. The only world building that happens is world building that those characters would be interested in beyond just the basics mm -hmm. that they have a reason to talk about or be interested in or engage with. Like I have a magic system for Legends and Lattes and the whole second book was going to get to talk about that because those characters happened to be interested in it and it was central to the story. But Thus far, nobody in any of these books has been interested enough in it for me to have an opportunity to tell anybody about it. So I won't. <laughs> um, I'll read it. Um, so 
I, I do have to ask if you're a, a planner or a pantser, did you, when you sat down to write lattes, did you have an outline or did you just start writing? Uh, lattes was my first outlined book. I thought I was a pantser. I wanted to be desperately for my entire <laughs> life. And it turns out that I am not. So one of my realizations is that if you are doing something and it never works, maybe you should do the other thing. So I am now a plotter, um, but I have to plot in a very specific way. Um, I had tried outlining before and it didn't work for me, but the reason it didn't work for me was because I basically did like a bullet point outline. Here are the events that happen in this chapter. I know all the things that have to happen and now I'll just tell the story. What I actually have to do is summarize each chapter in plain English like I'm talking to somebody, like mm -hmm. I'm telling you the story in short mm -hmm. because it makes me solve all these problems that I wouldn't otherwise solve. Um, and that's what ultimately makes it possible for me to get to the end of the book. Mm -hmm. How long is that usually? The outline? The the little short part of it for to start writing. It's usually just a paragraph for each chapter. So I, I, I lay out every chapter telling the story all the way through. Um, and each one has to be basically a summary of what really needs to happen there. Um, and it just helps me make sure that I don't lose track of what needs what needs to occur for those characters. And ideally, it makes it obvious for me how something has changed by the end of the chapter. Mm -hmm. Are my characters different now? Is the state of affairs different? If it's the same as it was last chapter, do I need this chapter? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Yeah. Well, one of the things I always hear from authors, no matter if they're a pot, plotter or a pantser, is that sometimes their characters just don't do what they want them to do. So does has mm -hmm. that happened to you? Um, a little bit, but more, it's more about, um, I get to sound that out in the outline. Mm -hmm. So during the outlining process, I will discover that this character doesn't need to do what I thought they were going to need to do, but I get to kind of figure that out at a high level. Sometimes when I'm writing the chapter, a new avenue to accomplish the same thing may appear for that character. And I'm delighted if that happens, especially if it makes the story better. Um, so they'll make some minor deviations, but they don't just suddenly go off and become somebody else and become a character I didn't expect them to be. Um, I usually get to figure that out much, much earlier mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's going to go off the rails. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the thing I hear from authors is like, yeah, I was going to do this and it just went completely in a different direction. Um, Michelle says in both books, Viv has sapphic re relationships. Did you have a reason or purpose for adding this dynamic? Either way, I really appreciated the representation. So in Legends and Lattes, um, originally Tandri and Viv's relationship was just supposed to be incredibly good friendship, a really good adult friendship, because mm -hmm. that's what I wanted. Um, and about halfway through, it became obvious to me that it was a little more than that. It still wasn't the point of the story or the A plot or even the B plot, but it felt like a natural evolution. And it was the kind of relationship that I wanted to read about. Um, um, and it just it did, didn't matter if they were the same gender. It, it, I was... Delighted for it to be a sapphic uh, romance, but it hadn't been my initial intent. Um, and then when I understood that about Viv, when it came time to write the first book, I already knew who she was. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to know was what would make her the kind of person who would be that careful in a relationship later? What would, they, what would make her hesitant? What, what would make her not just leap in like an adventurer and... Uh, and treat it as a potentially disposable relationship. And so she has a summer fling that that gives that is foundational for the kind of person that she eventually becomes. Mm -hmm. So Daisy sounds like had a very emotional response to your book. She said, is it ridiculous that I ugly sobbed at the world word wives in the epilogue? Also, who's your favorite character you created in Bookshop? Because it, Satchel made me smile too. Um, I, I'm, I'm flattered that it, I'm flattered that that worked emotionally for you. I really liked writing the epilogue. I liked being able to tell a little bit more about Legends and Lattes. It's not exactly a sequel, but it is an extension. Mm -hmm. Um, my favorite character is Fern. Oh, really? Um, I Why? have a soft spot. I have a soft spot for characters that swear. Um, <laughs> and, um, I just, I love how, um, I love how honest she is and I like, I like how, what her foundational care is. She ultimately cares about other people in a way that I have noticed that many other people who sell books care about other people. Mm -hmm. They want them to find something that's important to them in a book that makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty laudable. <laughs> Absolutely. I love bookshops, of course, because I love 
books, right? And I, I thought you did, in both books, you did such an amazing job of actually doing that sort of, well, we keep calling a slice of life of like, what is actually happening in a bookshop? What is actually happening in um, you know, a, a coffee shop. A coffee shop, yeah. Yeah, which is so comforting and um, and real. I love that. Um, John asks, what's your favorite part of writing dialogue? And I would like to know, as he has written, what was your favorite line to write? Um, I, my favorite part of writing dialogue, it's hard to, is there a part of it? Um, I just like the act of doing it. I like, because it's, you're you're pinning this voice to a page. So I know what this sounds like and what I want you to hear and pinning it down is rewarding. It's, mm -hmm. Text is often a very imperfect version of audio. We're trying, the original stories were all spoken orally. Mm -hmm. Text is this attempt to get that tacked to, to paper mm -hmm. and making that happen and feeling like it succeeded is really satisfying. As far as my favorite line to write is probably Amity Lept. What? <laughs> Amity Lept. It's the last line of Legends and of the Lattes. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, of course. That was great. <laughs> um, I am going to say why. Why was that your favorite line to write? Um, I've just, it, I just felt it immensely satisfying. I, I've, I loved the lady or the tiger moment of it. Um, when I set out to write Legends and Lattes, I wanted there to be no violence past the first sentence. Not, not really. But I wanted to imply violence past the last sentence. And I just liked that I we could do it with two words mm -hmm. and that people would have a very vivid idea of what happens. I just love the simplicity of the sentence, but that it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. Audra, who has still talking to have uh, getting information from her nine year old, um, says, will there be merchandise because her nine year old wants a plush fern and thimble? I would love a plush too. Um, <laughs> I mean, I made a bunch of mugs and stickers. If you want mugs and stickers and shirts, I did it because people kept asking and they're on my website. Um, but I would, I would adore, a, I really want a pot roast plush. That's what I want <laughs> more than anything else. That would be awesome. Um, okay. So we just have a couple more minutes. What was your favorite book to read as a kid? Gosh, that's hard. That's so hard. Nicobobinus by Terry Jones. Oh, okay. Awesome. Go look um, that up. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite coffee drink or pastry? Uh, my favorite coffee drink is a mezzo mezzo, which is a little bit of um, raw sugar um, that's steamed with basically an Americano and then an espresso and then a little bit of steamed milk. That would keep me up like for three days. Um, <laughs> and pastry? Scones. Cranberry mm -hmm. scones. I'm with you there. Although I would go with chocolate chip. I know. It's I'm a good weird. choice. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, people really want to know in our last couple of minutes, if you're going to write more of Viv's story. Um, so there will definitely be another book in the series. I, my aim is not to have Viv as the main character. I would like her to pop up but I, my aim is not to have this be the Viv show. I really do want to write about other people. Um, but I like the Discworld model of writing a series where everything is standalone, but all the characters tend to dip in and out. And over time, you get a bigger and better picture of the world. I, I also like not having to read all the books if I don't want to. So mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate that kind of standalone nature. So I hope that she appears again. But if I have my druthers, she won't be the main, at least not for the next book. All right. Well, if people here are like me, I have to read things in order. So it doesn't matter if you <laughs> if you want them to be standalone. I'm going to have to read them in order anyways. Um, so last question from Roy. Um, are you going to obviously you'll continue writing cozy fantasy because you're going to write definitely another story in this in this world. But do you have uh, plans on writing any other genres or any other kinds of books within cozy fantasy? Um, I would like to write several books that are outside of Cozy Fantasy. In fact, Cozy Fantasy was never what I expected I would be writing. Um, uh, so I have several other stories that I'm interested in writing. Tor's Game, and they are definitely not Cozy Fantasy. One is kind of sci-fi. Um, one is fantasy, but it's like weird Americana, Rust Belt fantasy. I don't know how to describe that. Um, and neither of them are specifically cozy, but all of them are ultimately going to be interested in the characters first. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind you that you did promise to write a cozy horror. 
Yeah, it's a, and now I have to have that on the list too. That's right, because it's on, it's on the video, so that means it's true. It's going to happen. <laughs> um, this has been amazing, Travis. Thank you so much for spending your hour with us and answering all of our many, many questions, mine included. And I really appreciate everybody being here and really asking some wonderful questions, I thought, about, um, about Travis's history and um, future. So, Travis? My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Looking forward to more from you. And, um, you know, if you want his books, they're at the library or you can buy them from Auntie's Bookshop. Have a wonderful night, everybody. And thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye.